the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, the year 2020 is proving to be a very interesting year. Our ways of both being and doing church are finding themselves tested in ways that I don't think we would have thought possible even just last year. And in ways that our ancestors of 151 years ago, when the diocese formally came into being, simply could not have conceived or even had the vocabulary to deal with. Words like Zoom, COVID, virtual meetings, to name just a few. But this is where we are. And this is what we are dealing with as best we can and in ways that are never going to suit all of us. This is a recorded charge. And for Synod, I'm delivering it from a written script, a way of presentation that I find quite challenging, but the choice for this year. And yes, for those who have been gently reminding me in the past, there will be a written record of what I'm saying for the posterity we imagine or hope will follow us. I'd like to read a verse from the scriptures, a verse from the Old Testament. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This verse from the very beginning of the book of Exodus is setting the scene for us readers about the people of Israel, God's chosen people living in Egypt in a time of difficulty and a time of change. And the book of Exodus goes on to describe for us how God calls Moses, deals with Pharaoh, and how the people leave a state of oppression and slavery and move on to something new. Promises that God would act and work in ways unknown to the people of the time. All that we know that led up to this point in the life of the Israelite people is written in the book of Genesis. And it begins by showing us the somewhat convoluted journey taken by humanity starting from a generalized prehistorical time, featuring in places the seemingly fantastical imagery of gardens with trees giving life and the knowledge of good and evil, talking serpents, giants, floods and the like. And we're then taken to the specific calling of an individual, Abraham. And then the miraculous supernatural coming of children and the beginnings of a dynasty. And we're shown that the growth of a family, which had in many ways developed against or despite of the natural trend of expectation into being a numerous, prosperous, influential group of people, all seeing themselves as descendants of one couple, now remembered as Abraham and Sarah. This people retained a distinct identity and were claiming a unique relationship with a God who'd made them enormous promises and surprisingly blessed them found themselves to be assets and blessings to others. And as if to demonstrate this, the story leads us on to Joseph. Taken from this people as a slave into exile, but rising to provide the means of salvation to both his family, and that included his treacherous brothers and the people to whom he'd been sold into slavery. We really don't need to rely on the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical to see how in Egypt, Joseph pretty much saved the day. He'd been given a dream. He held on to it and lived with it, despite how the circumstances of the occasion could have led him into despair. Joseph was influential, honored, and he served Egypt. He even saved Egypt. His family had been welcomed in as honored guests and were respected and they prospered. And then a new king arose who did not know Joseph. Our society here in Otago and Southland is at a point where exciting things are certainly happening. But it's increasingly a society that has lost contact with the church. I suspect I'm saying nothing new here when I tell you that we no longer hold an automatic, privileged or even recognised place in society. Where once church, and that includes all churches, were seen as being integral parts of the community, they're now seen as having little relevance that is, if they're actually seen at all. Where there was once a widespread, if basic understanding of Christianity, that's now not the case. As an example, fewer and fewer people are familiar with the Lord's Prayer, once a fundamental for many school children. So how open and enthusiastic are we to teaching others how to pray? Perhaps as we were once taught, or perhaps in new ways, 
just as we are continuing to learn to pray ourselves. And what might it mean today to be a Christian or to hold on to Christian values? What does that mean for individuals? What does it mean for the communities that these individuals make up? And what about society round about? A new king has arisen in Egypt. And just as the privileges and respect that went with Joseph and his people had largely evaporated by the time of Moses, so too with us today. And yet it's into this situation that Moses was given a new understanding of God and he received a new call and a new commission. And he became a witness of what God was doing. And that's a pattern I see repeated again and again throughout the history of the people of God. The God who has always looked like Jesus Christ, which is something the church is constantly needing to remember and live and demonstrate, continues to call and to commission and to challenge individuals and communities. And in the bigger scheme of things, this COVID crisis, societal indifference, internal divisions or anything else will not be able to defeat or overcome us as the church. And many of us are already seeing how being church is changing and they're embracing it. Remaining true to fundamental foundational elements of our faith, we're seeing how this is working out in our diocese and in our time in new ways. Now the pioneers of our church and our diocese wanted to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to people who had never realized it. They also sought to care for each other and to serve in remote and isolated locations. They wanted to live and to worship, to serve and enjoy God in all the places they had traveled to and were settling in. And the statutes and canons and procedures we still have today were put in place, not as hurdles for us to negotiate, but as features to facilitate and ensure the safe and smooth running for the church, to provide for the church to grow and continue its work. I believe we need to stay close to their original intention which was to allow us to continue with this mission. Now the sacrifices made by our forebears were significant and the diocese that has developed from it is serving us well. And we are seeing today new ways that God is growing his kingdom. Now Richard Johnson and Jonathan Wood have shown us the importance of relationship. That little video clip of some of their thinking, their calling, commitment and activity really excited me. The relationships that are growing from their ministry are as a result of the church reaching out to others. And the people they are feeling called to are those who cannot or will not go into church buildings. Neither do they fit into existing regular structures. And it's into this setting where Jonathan and Richard are making relationships, which is a reflection of the activity of a God who goes to extraordinary lengths to bring us into an ongoing relationship with him. John Graveston, our diocesan child, youth and family educator, recently started a young adults group. And from within this group, there are developing friendships and yes, relationships. And it's from this setting that coming opportunities to engage with God. It's somewhere where they can practice prayer, ask questions, to come as you are, part of an existing church group or as someone with no faith and no church background. John was perhaps most excited by one member who told him that being part of this group was the most connected to church they had ever felt. And this person doesn't claim Anglican history. This is an expression of church, but one without its own building or having to meet on a Sunday. Some of my predecessor bishops would have had to rely on only occasional visits to most of the diocese, and even then sometimes on horseback, I guess. Today, I have the ability to share morning and evening prayer with folk from all parts, thanks to the technology of Zoom, and even to welcome visitors from overseas. Someone in the diocese shared with me recently how these Zoom services provided the first time they were able to share in a Christian service with a close family member living overseas, someone who'd come to faith recently themselves. I hope that excites you. It made me quite emotional. I'm looking to see how we can use this sort of technology to provide contact, relationship and teaching to some of the more remote parts of the diocese, perhaps involving a mentoring scheme that takes people from where they are and brings an educational opportunity 
tailored to their current place on the Christian journey. A mentor who might at one level be teaching someone how to pray and explaining what the Bible is, and at the other extreme, encouraging someone else into engaging with tertiary level theological study. The opportunities are out there for us. And as we look to repairing the recent fire and water damage done at the cathedral, I believe we have a great chance to look at what can be imagined and attempted. And this has come at a pivotal time for us. And at the heart of the vision that is underpinning the restoration and development of the buildings is a desire that the cathedral will become a place better equipped and suited to serve the city, parish and diocese, using that near disaster to build something better. Retaining some of the identity and practices that help define us and have sustained us over many years, but looking to express this today in new and in fresh ways. Our diocese, of course, is bigger than just an Eden. And this week I received a request from one of our smaller parishes, one that has no dedicated clergy person, and some people who've noted an ageing and small population, but asking the question, how can they reach out to the more vulnerable members of the community? This is a great question coming out of a specific setting and addressing a specific need. There are new opportunities. There are new ways that are enabling our foundational values of prayer, reading the Bible and living out the risen life of Jesus Christ to be experienced and practiced. In the time of Moses, there did indeed arise a new king who never knew Joseph. We are living in times when some of the practices and privileges of our past are now over but we are seeing ways in which we are still being called to be God's people. We're learning to live with new challenges and in new circumstances. And we are being reminded that we are still the people who are to live and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord.